to this event. So what this is, uh, is uh, a conversation with playwrights about first scenes. Um, when we were trying to figure out what to do this evening, uh, we, we knew that we wanted to get a bunch of playwrights together and, and look at some scenes and talk about them as writers. Uh, uh, Doug Langworthy had the great idea of maybe we do first scenes and uh, therefore they need no introduction. We don't need to tell you anything about the play. We can start cold because that's where we will start naturally in the play. Um, I really love this idea because part of my uh, work here that I'm doing in my fellowship is I'm reading a lot of plays and as a playwright it's a very, uh, it, it's, a, it's an incredible lesson uh, in playwriting when you have to read other people's plays and you understand just how important a first scene actually is when you're reading your 20th play that week. Um, first scenes are very important. So um, I'm gonna let everybody introduce themselves. Uh, well, we're, the format, we're just going to read a couple of scenes that we've picked um, and then we're gonna talk about them. Uh, it may be interesting, it may not be interesting. <laughs> I make no promises. I will say that the scenes are good. <laughs> so at least there's that. Uh, we definitely have some good writing on display. Um, with the exception of one, none of us are actors. So let's keep our expectations down, okay? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is all for the sake of, of, of a conversation. Um, uh, let's just go around and introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Anne Garcia Romero. I'm Kemp Powers. I'm Lauren Yee. I'm Regina Taylor. I'm Robert Schenken. Go on. Hi, Emily Tarquin, Artistic Associate here, Stage Directions. <laughs> Emily's going to be doing our Stage Directions tonight. So, yes, please. And everybody. <laughs> so, um, we are going to start with. Uh, what I think is like a uh, quintessential first scene. I'm not going to sit here with you guys. Uh, we're going to start with Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? <laughs> Set in darkness, crash against front door. Martha's laughter heard. Front door opens. Lights are switched on. Martha enters, followed by George. Jesus! H. Christ! God sakes, Martha, it's two o'clock in the morning. Oh, George. Well, I'm sorry, but What a you cluck, know, what a cluck you it's are. It's late, you know, late. What a dump. <laughs> <laughs> What's that from? What a dump. How would I know? Oh, what? come on, what's it from? You know. Martha. What's it from, for Christ's sake? <laughs> what's what from? I just told you, I just did. What a dump. What's that from? I haven't the faintest idea. Dumb Bell! It's from some goddamn Betty Davis picture, some goddamn Warner Brothers epic. Well, look, I can't remember all the pictures. Nobody's okay. asking you to remember every single goddamn Warner Brothers epic, just one, one single little epic. Betty Davis gets peritonitis in the end. She's got this big black fright wig she wears all through the picture, and she gets peritonitis, and she's married to Joseph Cotton or something. Somebody. Somebody. And she wants to go to Chicago all the time because she's in love with that actor with the scar, but she gets sick and she sits down in front of her dressing what, what, table. What, what actor? What scar? I can't remember his name, for God's sake, what's the name of the picture? I want to know what the name of the picture is. She sits in front of her dressing table and she's got this peritonitis and she tries to put her lipstick on but she can't and she gets it all over her face but she she decides to go to Chicago anyway and Chicago it's called Chicago uh, what, what is? the picture the picture uh, is called God Chicago Creed, don't you know anything Chicago was a 30s musical starring little Miss Alice Faye don't you know anything well, you know, that was probably before my time. Oh, Ken. <laughs> Just cut that out. This picture, 
Betty Davis comes home from a hard day at the grocery store. She, she works at a grocery store? Oh, she's store? a housewife. She buys things, and she comes home with the groceries, and she walks into the modest living room of the modest cottage, modest Joseph Cotton has set her up are, are in. Are they married? Yes, they're married to each other. And she comes in, and she looks around, and she puts her groceries down, and she says, what a dump. Oh. <laughs> She's discontent. Oh. Well, what's the name of the picture? I really don't know, Martha. Well, think. I'm tired, dear. It's uh, late, uh -huh. and besides. I don't know, you know what I... you're tired, so tired about. You haven't done anything all day. You didn't have any classes well, or anything. Well, you know, I'm tired. If your father didn't set up these goddamn oh. Saturday well, night orgies all the time. Well, that's too bad about you, George. Well, that's how it is anyway. You didn't do anything. You never do anything. You never mix. You just sit around and talk. Well, what do you want me to do? You, you, you want me to act like you do? You want me to go around all night braying at everybody the way you do? I don't bray! <laughs> I do not bray. All right, I said, you didn't bray. Make me a drink. <laughs> what? I said, make me a drink. Well, I don't suppose a nightcap would kill either one of us. A nightcap, are you kidding? We've got guests. We've, we've got what? Guests, guests! Guests? Yes. Guests, people, we've got guests coming over. When? Now! Good Lord, Martha, do, do you know what time, uh, who is coming over? What's their name? Who? What's their name? Who what's their name? I don't know what their name is, George. You met them tonight. They're new. He's in the math department or something. Uh, 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 who are these people? You met them tonight. I don't George. remember meeting anybody tonight. Well, you did. Will you give me my drink, please? He's in the math department at about 30, blonde and... And uh, good looking? Uh, yes, and yeah, good figures. looking. <laughs> and his wife, a massive little type without any hips or anything. <laughs> oh, okay. You remember them now? Yes, I guess so, Martha, but why in God's name are they coming over here now? Because Daddy said we should be nice to them, that's why. Oh, Lord. May I have my drink, please? Daddy said we should be nice to them. Thank you. But why now? Because It's Daddy after 2 o'clock in the morning, and... Because Yes, but I'm sure your father didn't mean we were supposed to stay up all night with these people. I mean, we could have them over on oh. Sunday or something. Well, never mind. Besides, it is Sunday, very early I Sunday. I mean, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> well, it's done. All right. Well, where are they? If we've got guests, where are they? They'll be here soon. What did they do? Go home and get some sleep first or something? <laughs> They'll be here soon. You know, I wish you would tell me about something sometime. I wish you would stop springing mm, things on I me don't all the time. I don't spring things on you, you all yes, the time. Yes, you do. Time. You really do. You are always springing things on me. Oh, always. Poor Georgie, poor Georgie. Put a bomb in the pot. Mm. Aww. What are you doing? Are you sulking, hmm? Let me see, are you sulking? Is that what you're doing? Never mind, Martha. Mm. Oh. Just mm. don't oh. bother yourself, all right? Oh. Hey. Hey. Hey! <laughs> <coughs> Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Virginia Woolf, Virginia Woolf. <laughs> What's the matter? Didn't you think that was funny, huh? I thought it was a scream, a real scream. You didn't like it, huh? It was all right, Martha. 
You laughed your head off when you heard it at the party. I smiled. I did not laugh my head off. I smiled, you know? I mean, it was all right. You laughed your goddamn head off. It was all right. It was a scream! It was very funny, yes. You make me puke. What? Mm. You make me puke. <laughs> You know, Martha, that's not really a very nice thing to say. <laughs> All right. So technically the first scene of Virginia Woolf is the entire first act, but we decided not to do that. <laughs> um, that was great. Don't you feel like we should just add this to the season? <laughs> like have them stay a little longer? Um, so now this is the part of the, the evening we have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, which is basically we're going to talk about this. And I, I, I can start the ball rolling just to lead by example. Um, what I, listening to this scene, what's so amazing to me is the entire play is there in that, in, in that exchange. You know, everything... Everything that we need to know about the evening ahead is, is there. The, uh, the, the baiting, the drinking, the attraction to Nick is already implanted there. Um, the, of course, the, the title of the play is in there. Um, and there's something that happens which is so amazing, which he does so gracefully, some, subtly, well, not subtly, actually, but gracefully and just pointedly says, oh, we're not going to bed. We have guests coming over. Like that simple statement is like where the play turns almost. I mean, that, 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 that for, uh, you know, four pages we think we're going to bed. And then, you know, imagine being an audience seeing this play for the first time um, and not knowing what the hell is going on, but seeing these two people bickering on stage. And it's funny, it's very funny, but it's also like, it's very off-putting, you know? And, um, but then that one line is, we've got guests. And then, I just, I, I made a note of that, how it just sort of turned a corner and like, oh my God, we're going to be up all night with these people. Um, so I, did, did I, that, do you, did, please everybody just jump in. And I, and I mean, I think in, in addition to like turning a corner to like continue like the car metaphor, I feel like you see where like the pileups are going to be. Mm. I was like, it's 2 a.m., they're drinking, you know, like, like the obstacles have already been set in place for like the road that we're traveling down. Um, and I think like one thing that hit me now um, in hearing it is just like that we kind of come in at like, at like the moment right before crisis mm -hmm. in a way that like, um, you know, like in plays a lot of the time they, you know, you talk about like framing, like how do you frame the scene? Like at what point do you enter mm -hmm. the story? And I feel like that's such a good moment to like enter, mm. enter into this world. You know what it just made me think about is the beginning of Reasons to be Pretty, mm -hmm. which if, if anybody knows that play, the Neil Labute play, it starts with a five, I mean, the, the play begins at like 80 decibels. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there's no, there, there's no easing into it. It just, it is starts. Is it like that breakup there, scene? It's, it's, no, it's, there, it's, it's when she finds out that he said that she's got an, an average oh, face. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, reasons it, it is reasons to be pretty, right? Yeah, it's reasons to be yeah. pretty, and, and um, this has already happened off stage. The play has, you know, the, the play begins with the fight, and it's this guy. She, he, she, this woman finds out that her boyfriend said she has an average face, and. And that's really the beginning of the entire play. I mean, um, and so I love that they sort of come in with yeah. this, this heated energy. Um, and I'm struck too by how um, the use of Betty Davis really sets up character, how he masterfully brings in All About Eve and kind of sets up this, what's, what that movie and what's it called, and says that what a dump line many times. So we get this image of Betty Davis in All About Eve and Martha. Mm. So you know instantly what kind of woman she is, what she likes, and he just masterfully combines like popular culture and this world, so we kind of know who she is right away. There's also something I, 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 it, 
George continues to bait Martha about their age difference, that she's older than him, and that's in there too. You know, there, there's a great talk, there's a great line and I think the second act when they're talking about uh, weight, what do you weigh? The two men are talking and like, what do you weigh? And then and George has this great line, she says, Martha is 104 years old. <laughs> um, there's also something in George that is so, you can see that power dynamic there. It's like he's letting her win. Um, uh, you know, it depends on the version of the play that you see and the, 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 the but, there, there's that the the idea of George letting her, you know, giving her enough rope. Um, I like the I like the notion that um, that there are clues there or or um, aspects of the play that will be revealed to us, and we'll go back later and say, oh yes, of course it was right there. Mm. Um, to me, uh, the success of a good first scene is that it asks. It asks a good question. Mm -hmm. It asks a question I want to see an answer to, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's what that's what this play does. More than it tells me, it's it su suggests things, it implies things, it tantalizes me with things, but it leaves me with this question: is, What is up with these people? What, what is what is going on here? What's the why do they stay together? Why what what is the link here? What did, what's what's the motor in this relationship? Uh, for me. The, the one line that I am always drawn to in the scene is married to something, somebody, somebody. That to me is kind of the, the, the essence of Martha says, oh, she was married to something, and George corrects her, somebody, not a thing, a person, somebody, mm -hmm. and she accepts that. And that's really ultimately what the play comes down to is them finding some way to be human with each mm -hmm. other as opposed to turning the other into this device, this thing mm -hmm. that keeps me going in my despair. Um, mm. yeah. Yes. Uh, it, it's really great, just at the introduction of the characters. Uh, we have the dynamics from the very beginning. Uh, we see that he's uh, seemingly laid back, but he is baiting her as much as she's baiting him. She's louder, you get the, uh, the clear, braying. Mm -hmm. Brain, and I was thinking, brain is this sound. What is that sound? That is this cry, as well as this it's a, a bit of a howl, uh, a pain. Uh, and you wonder then, how did they get here? Uh, from the very top, how did they get here mm -hmm. to this point? Uh, looking at it from, from Mark. Woman. I also think about, you know, this is a play that we, many people know. Playwrights obviously know this play very well. Um, I just listening to it, I just I think what what must this have been like for those first audiences who don't have our benefit of, of all this knowledge of the play of what is going to come next. Um, they, you know, introducing Nick and 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 Honey in in, in such a. a, a a, a very specific but also very succinct way. I mean, he, he's good looking, she has no hips. I mean, that's, that's basic, I mean, that's, you know, boiling them down to, you know, the casting call. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and I think the one thing that we didn't do at the beginning of this conversation is talk about the idea of, of, of first scenes. Um, and and um, uh, like I said, when I started reading these plays, I, I was struck by just like what what it was about first scenes that, that grabbed me. And for me, reading these, you know, reading a play like this, obviously, but reading other wonderful plays that came across uh, my iPad um, was, was, you know, is there, is there something compelling? Is there something that, does, is it, does it feel mysterious? Does it feel, what is the thing that grabs you? What is the thing that, paint, that creates a world? Um, uh, what, in my case, for, for the, you know, reading a play, what keeps me reading, you know, what, what keeps you engaged? And this, I mean, for me, I mean, it's interesting. I was trying to think, once we found out what the plays were going to be for tonight, what are components of <clears throat> first scenes of plays that I really enjoy that they all have in common? And I find that a strong first scene gives me a really great understanding of the main characters and their motivation which then allows a good playwright to kind of turn my expectations of those characters on, 
on its head later. Mm. So, I mean, I hate to use like a football metaphor, but since we're in the home of the Super Bowl champions, um, <laughs> I was explaining, it, it reminded me of a conversation I had with a friend from England about why American football is so popular. And mm. I said it's because everyone watching it at home feels like they're smarter than the coach. <laughs> like you're calling plays, but then the coach does something unexpected, mm. and it surprises you. And in many right. ways, strong first scenes and plays give me that same feeling. I start off the play going, well, I know this guy. I've seen this guy a million times. Mm -hmm. And then it defies my expectations mm -hmm. later on in the play. So. It's wonderful. Yeah, I, I often feel like a, a great tool that is in the playwright's arsenal is allowing the audience to think that they're smarter than mm -hmm. you. Allowing the audience to think that they know what, what, what you know, um, and then, you know, subverting. Um, shall we do an, another one? Yeah. Let's do another one. Um, all right, we're going to do a little bit of rearranging here so we can have the table. Of course. New Vic to you. Um, yeah, you're coming over here. We didn't rehearse this. No, we didn't tell. <laughs> So this next scene is from, uh, so that was, you know, that's a play that most people know, most people have seen, most people have least <laughs> know. Do so we chair. miss a chair? Oh, perhaps <laughs> <laughs> um, Most people know, most people have seen, or at the very least have seen the film. Um, this is a play uh, that very likely you may not know. Um, uh, it hasn't, play, to my knowledge, played in, in Colorado yet, and um, it was in New York earlier, uh, I guess last year now. Uh, so this is the first scene from a play uh, by Rajiv Joseph called Guards of the Taj. Agra, India, 1648, night. Humayun, a young imperial guard, stands watch. Brilliant stars dot the sky, but there is no moon. Crickets chirp the distant call of a crazed bird, otherwise silent. Another guard, Babur, hurriedly enters, very much disheveled, late to his post. He awkwardly sets up in guard position a few feet away from Humayun, trying to get properly dressed. Humayun doesn't move, but he's clearly irritated by Babur. Finally, Babur is set. He stands at attention, like Humayun. Babur switches his wait, sword. Wait, wait. Sorry. Sorry. Wrong hand. Babur switches his sword to the proper hand, holding the blade perfectly upright against his body. A long beat, they stand guard, crickets, the same crazy bird calls out. Ow! Shh! <laughs> Which one is that? Shh! Crazy I, bird again. I don't know them like you know them. The birds. Which bird is that one? Chickadee, sand grass, thick knee? Shut up! You always know the birds. I don't know any birds. Or... Would you be quiet? I'm just saying. Imp Imperial guards of the great walled city of Agra, sworn to the eternal dominion of his most supreme benevolence, Emperor Shah Jahan, do not speak. You just spoke. <laughs> Among the sacred oaths that the Mughal Imperial Guard is to never speak. You keep talking about not talking. In silence, we are vigilant. Swearing an oath not to speak. Contradiction. Babur, stop. You have to be careful. OK. I'm serious. OK. They'll release us from this honored fleet without a second thought. The tiniest of infractions will see us both gone. Quick stuff to the lowliest gullies of Agra. You won't tell on me. Well, I won't lie. Oh, come on. We're brothers, you and me. We're not brothers. We're just friends. That's insensitive. That makes me sad. I think of you as a brother. As a, as a, as a bi. You, you call me bi. I call you bi. Don't make me lose my job. <laughs> you? And who is your father? Only simply the highest of high command in the all-on-high Imperial Guard. My father yearns for my defeat. Always has. You know him. Sons are sons, fathers are fathers, and one day you will be chief top boss man of the Imperial Guard just like him. That will never happen. He thinks I'm soft. Stop talking. Stand guard. Another bird sounds, then quiet. You know what I wonder about? No, shut up. I was wondering. When will we get to guard the Imperial harem? Ha! <laughs> no, I'm serious, when? Guards of the Imperial harem are tip-top guards. Seniority, best position in the fleet. We are not tip-top. We get the dawn watch. We'll both be gray and toothless before they let us guard the harem. But your father, maybe he could- That will never happen. Never? Absolutely never. Man, I want to see that harem. <laughs> it's supposed to be pretty boring. Really? 
It's not so salacious a venue as the gossip would have you think. It's a harem. It's a government department, like any other office. <laughs> it's where the emperor does his most confidential work. Thus, only the Mahaldar, the concubines, and eunuchs are allowed within the walls, and the two most trusted imperial guards, who are decidedly not us. But I mean, surrounded by naked women. It's not like that. OK. It's not some depraved house of sluts. OK. It's not some hotbed of wanton lust. OK. It's just, you know, a place the emperor goes to work. Both guys imagine what goes on in the harem. Humayun clears his throat. <laughs> Let's stand guard. What do you think it'll look like? They say it's white. Yeah, but just white? Is it skinny? Is it fat? I mean, what shape will it be? All we know are these protective walls that have hidden it the last 16 years. The city within the city. It's crazy! 16 years in the making. Since we were kids, they've been building this. And yet we have no idea what it'll look like. Because within the walls, where Taj Mahal is built, another city, a secret one, with strange men who have lived a different life than anyone else. And now, overnight, those protective walls have been torn down to reveal Taj Mahal to the world for the first time ever. His most supreme emperor Shah Jahan decreed that no one shall see it until it is fully completed. But why? There need not be a reason. It is a royal decree. The construction of Taj Mahal is not to be seen by anyone except the masons, laborers, and slaves who exist within its walls. And the architect, Ustad Isa. <laughs> Ustad Isa. Ustad Isa. They say he's the smartest man in the kingdom, in any kingdom, the smartest man on earth. Doubtful. He speaks to the king. He looks the king in the eye. He is equal to the king. That is mild to medium sedition. But then he drinks with the masons. And he frequents the whores. He's cross-eyed and overweight. He, he built a school for the peasant children on his day off. I saw it. It was too big. He's, <laughs> he smiles at everyone. Can you imagine such a thing, smiling at every person? The happiest man in the world. 16 years in the making, surrounded by these walls, so that no one may see it until it is complete. Which is today's first light. Which is today's first light. And for 16 years, he built this thing. He smiles at everyone because he is happy, because he made Taj Mahal. Ustad Isa is amazing. Even God couldn't make Taj Mahal. Blasphemy! Would you stop? Don't forget the punishment for blasphemy. It's three days in prison. That is weird though, isn't it? What? Mild sedition, for example, making a joke. Mild sedition is whipping, shaved head, torture. But blasphemy, just three days in jail. And if the emperor doesn't really care about speaking ill of Allah, he's way more concerned about himself. Don't test him. And stop with this Ustad Isa talk. Taj Mahal was made by his sovereign ruler, of Hindustan, Shah Jahan, who built this for his tragic queen, her excellent empress Mumtaz Mahal. This is her tomb, a mausoleum to honor her for all time. Nah. Now what? <laughs> Ustad Isa, he made Taj Mahal. Oh yeah? Did Ustad Isa import the Pietra Dora from Greece? Or the herringbone from Iraq? Or the marble from China? Or 700 tons of jasper from some damn fool slum in Uzbekistan? No, he didn't. Shah Jahan did. Usta Isa says that today's first light is important for Taj Mahal because after today, the air and the rain and the sand and the heat of the sun will start to age her perfect face. But that today, at first light, Taj Mahal will be the most beautiful thing in the history of everything that has ever existed. Think about it. The most beautiful thing ever made. Taj Mahal is sitting there waiting to be lit by the day's first light, waiting to be seen. We are not turning around. Oh, come on, man! No, we are guarding. We are facing south, not north, south. But just for a quick moment, just, we could just turn around, turn right back around. Absolutely not. Imperial guards do not move from their post. They don't speak either, but here we are, talking for a long we time. We are not turning around. We are imperial guards. This is very important to me. To me as well, but... People are watching us. Ooh. Elders waiting for us to deviate from the sacred oaths? You and me, Babor, there is no one below us. If there is a post that nobody wants, for example, the one single guard post that faces away from Taj Mahal at dawn, 
then we are assigned to that post. We are grunts of the Imperial Force until that day new appointments are made. And until that day, we get the jobs nobody else wants. Unless, of course, we are sacked for being stupid because we turned around at first light to see a white building. They'd send us to the brink. We'd end up patrolling Kashmir, a place to which if some bastard is assigned, some bastard ends up dead. Do you want to go patrol Kashmir? No. Do you want 40 lashes and a shaved head? No. Do you want to be blinded by a dull blade or sewn into the hide of a water buffalo? No. Or maybe you want to end up like Court Ustadisa and... My name cuts off. Before notices. Wait, what? Nothing. No, what were you just saying? Nothing. Forget it. What about Ustadisa? Nothing. Oh, come on, what? Nothing. Umayyan. No. Uma. No. Tell me. No. What have you heard? It's simple. Don't be careless. Come on, tell me. Okay, but you can't tell anyone. I promise. Who keeps a promise better than me? <laughs> okay. It's been said that after the last jewels were inlaid and the last piece of marble polished, it has been said that this wastrel, this cur, Ustadisa, the proud architect who thinks himself equal to a king, approached Shah Jahan himself and asked his excellent Mughal lineage for a personal favor. A personal favor? Yes. He asked the emperor for a personal favor? <laughs> I don't even know which level of sedition that is because it's never been classified because nobody's ever done it. This is the kind of useless vagabond your brilliant artist is. He asked Shah Jahan, great-great-grandson of Babur, first Mughal emperor. My namesake. Your namesake. Usadista asked Shah Jahan for things such as these, personal things. My God. Yes. What was it? What was what? The personal favor. Usadista asked Shah Jahan if the 20,000 men who built it could wander the unsheathed Taj Mahal at first light so that they could see and admire their handiwork, this thing to which they owe the last 16 years of their lives. Oh. Huh. Huh. What did Shah Jahan, uh, what did Shah Jahan reply? His supreme, excellent, imperious royalty said no. Oh. But there is a rumor of having never in his life been asked a personal favor before. His most sovereign enlightened one needed time to fully Absorb the gross insult hurled upon him. The emperor is angry. Yeah, the emperor is angry. So now the emperor has issued a decree. Nothing so beautiful as Taj Mahal shall ever be built again. What kind of a decree is that? He ordered that the hands of every mason, laborer, and artisan who crafted Taj Mahal be chopped off. What? Wait, wait, wait. He's going to chop off 20,000 hands? 40,000. Because they wanted to look at Taj Mahal? We need not ask why. A royal decree is exactly that. Every worker? Every man who built this? Every one. So someone is going to have to chop off 40,000 hands. Yup. That's a terrible job. <laughs> Shit. Oh, no. Shit. Oh. That's us, right? Shit. Oh. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't either. Shit! <laughs> well, I think the emperor is overreacting. <laughs> 40,000 severed hands. What is the purpose of such punishment? Nothing so beautiful as Taj Mahal shall ever be built again. This news depresses Babur, also Humayun, although he won't admit it. Long beat, Babur looks at the stars. Almost first light. Babur turns around to look at the Taj. Babur, what are you doing? Turn back around, you can't. Babur! As Babur starts to really see the Taj, the Taj also transforms, each passing moment slowly bringing a new shade of morning light. Humeyun, turn around! Humeyun, Babur, if anyone sees you, why are you doing this, man? I think you should look. We can look at any other time. Any other time except now. Why is it so important to risk everything to look at this now? Turn around. With each second, Babor is more transformed. A new light shines on the Taj. He lowers his sword as if he had simply become too heavy. Babor, raise your sword. Babor drops his sword to the ground. Involuntarily, he doesn't even know he has done it. 
You drop your... Come on, man. You're an Imperial Guard. They'll... No one is watching. Not us, Uma. Trust me. There are no eyes in this land that would waste themselves on us. They are not watching us. They're watching this. This. Uma, bye. Look. Look and see. Uma Yun finally breaks, a little and very slowly, awkwardly turns around. He stares at the Taj. Both men do. After a moment and another shift of morning light, Humayun lowers his sword. Eventually, he drops his sword, too. Both men, without sound and without even knowing, begin to weep. They are experiencing awe in the most biblical sense. It is fear. It is one of the fires in the sky and landed in their city. Humayun hits Babur's arm and holds on to it, as if to make sure they both aren't dreaming. Humayun's clutch of Babur's arm slowly loosens, drops. The two men, as if to keep themselves slightly in reality, take each other's hands. They hold hands and watch the first light of day illuminate the Taj Mahal. Uh, I should say that the first time I heard this scene was uh, at the Steinberg Awards when Rajiv won uh, his Steinberg Award, and, and um, they uh, read this, and it was the first time anybody had ever heard this scene, and it, uh, let me tell you, it blew everybody away. I mean, it was just, it's just, I, I just think this is just one of the most beautiful scenes uh, ever, and especially as a first scene. I, I was, I was, I knew I had to include it in, in, in this. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're, I, even not having seen it in a production, this, this first scene for me was like, um, I, the, the only thing anybody could talk about was like, I, like what comes next? Like, you know? Um, and again, like the, the first scene, like George and Martha, I mean, the, these characters are so well defined. Again, there's, there, there's instant, um, you know, there's this instant uh, space for conflict between these two men. Um, uh, there's obviously this, 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 we've caught a little bit of the scene actually, they talk about their childhood in, a little bit in the scene too, uh, with Rajiv's permission, I should add. Um, uh, uh, and I, I, I love that uh, he, he, without showing us the Taj Mahal, he puts us, he puts us there. And, and, and for me, this scene just, I, I, I just, you know, whatever, wherever he takes us next, I, I as a viewer, want to go, as, a, as an audience member, want to go. Um, that's all I got right now. One thing I'm really struck by with first scenes is how a first line can encapsulate the entire play. And in this line, the first line is wrong hand. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, mm. And I feel like that is a clue to the entire play. Just well one done. Line. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, thematically and also as, as a bit of character, you know, the, the, this guy's late for work. <laughs> He's late for work. And he gets all ready and then he puts his sword in the wrong hand. Mm -hmm. um, and then his, his friend has his back, you know? Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a Vladimir and Estragon quality <laughs> to them yeah. as well in this scene. Mm -hmm. It also reminds me of, um, like I think a mentor of mine, Naomi Izuka, talks about the be at the beginning of the play, um, she kind of looks at it like you as a playwright are a host mm. and that you are a kind of like gracious host and that when somebody comes into your home or your play, you're kind of taking care of them. And I feel like this first scene takes care of us in such a wonderful way. It gives us a relationship that we care about. It gives us humor, it gives us setting. Um, like I feel like, you know, Rajiv is like giving us these cookies, so I'm like, I don't know what this is or where I am, but I'm so happy to be here mm -hmm. for another five minutes and another five yeah. minutes. Um, well, what's interesting too is that uh, going back to Virginia Woolf, I mean, well, what a place setting he's made for us. I mean, the the um, the, the 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 warm bath that is this mm -hmm. this scene, as opposed to the cold shower that is that that first scene. Um, and yet they do prepare you for the, 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 the story to come, you know? Um, I, I do know for a fact that my father hates Virginia Woolf with a passion. Uh, and, um, and I think that, 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 that my father, when he first saw the, uh, the play, just uh, I think that first scene was just like, 
three hours of these people, you know? Uh, uh, and yeah, but I, I love that idea of you yeah. are the host. Do you think he would have enjoyed Guards of the Taj? I think he would have loved Guards yeah. of the Taj. Um, my father loves Rajiv. Mm -hmm. I, he you know, wishes yeah. he were his son, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is, like, it is that like it welcomes you in to this world that otherwise might seem you know, like distant and far away. I mean, like the year is, I don't know, like 16, 1648. And it just feels so contemporary and like embracing. Well, let's talk about the language in it too. I mean, one of the things that is in the beginning, it says the actor should not speak with accents, which is a very, very conscious decision to not keep it trapped in amber. You know? Right, and, and also there's a lot of um, modern colloquialisms Pepper yeah. throughout it. Oh, come on, man. Yeah, like yup okay. and dang. Okay, yeah. and there's, there, he throws lots of those in there. Yeah. That, that does make it feel incredibly contemporary. And in the New York production, if anyone saw it, it was, you know, they were, it was, the, 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 the physical production was 1648. Mm -hmm. But then the language, you know, you, you walk into this theater and you, you, you see this world that is, um, and I think that's an, a, a very wonderful thing that, that he does in this first scene, in which he says, this is very, I mean, it's a very specific date. It isn't like, it's not saying it's, you know, it's not saying it's the 17th century, it's saying it's 1648. Mm -hmm. And yet, the language that he uses in this first scene instantly, um, for me at least, puts, you know, you just like wanna hear these guys banter all night. Because like, like for these two characters, the world is contemporary. Like they do not feel like they are in a museum piece. It's kind of like how like we look at black and white pictures of history. And for them, they were in full cut like in real life, they were in full color. Mm -hmm. But you know, we see them with this such this distance. Right. Like we I think we cut it out with the part where um Bavor is kind of talking about his flights of fantasy fancy and he's kinda of talking about an airplane. He invents, we'll an airplane. he invents an airplane <laughs> in his imagination. Right. So they talk about all of these yeah. and, and of course Human Yung keeps saying everything he says is absurd. Yeah. But as an audience member we just enjoy, you know, him talking about all these things that are going to come true. I mean that's what makes it also I'm trying not to talk I've seen this play as well and I don't want to ruin it for people <laughs> who see it, but it's just that's part of what makes it so such a tragic mm. story for me. Like yeah. it was really it was one of the my favorite things that I saw yeah, last year, and part of it, it was just so heartbreaking. It was a yeah, heartbreaking, heartbreak story. heartbreaking two-hander. Um, can we talk? <laughs> 40,000 hander. Yeah. Um, can we talk briefly uh, about, uh, if anybody wants to jump in, about your own approach to first scenes, and, and, and if any have a particularly uh, wonderful anecdote to tell about either having written, you know, how, how some of your plays start, um, You've written some very long plays in your day. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I've been those, told those, that. Those, 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 those first scenes are a distant memory by the time we, uh, we leave the theater. Um, can you talk about what you're, what, what you're, you know, do you, just in general or, or, or the way, you know, you have, a, you have a play going on right here as a matter of fact. Uh, I have a play going on right here, and, I'm, and I've just started a new play, so um, it's interesting. I, I, I am not uh, as crafty uh, as we've been talking about the construction of a first play, a first scene. I will go back over and over again and thread things through, but that first pass is a very visceral, emotional pass for me. Um, there's a lot going on, and, and, it, and sometimes it shows up, mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't, uh, and that's why I go back to it. But um, I've been working on this new play, and as I've been, I'm now 30 pages in, I know what the ending is. I often know what the ending is. And I was thinking about the last speech of the ending and how I should go back to the very beginning and, and plant one line mm. in the very beginning scene so that it will link up in the way I want it, in the, will have the effect I want it to have when I get to the end. So that's an ongoing process. It's, uh, it's, it's the play, as the play reveals itself to me more and more, I will find myself as I revise going back and re-exploring um, the first scene. And then I think uh, probably all of us have the same experience of, 
you, you know it and you know it and you know it and then you get in the rehearsal room with actors and then they find things that you, you didn't even think of. But they're there, they are there and the actor or the director or the designer pulls that out and you go, wow, I didn't, yes of course, of course, but I wasn't conscious of that because you're operating at a different level. I had an experience, so I had a play here, The Legend of Georgia McBride, which was done in New York last year, premiere here at the Denver Center. And we, thank you. Um, and um, when we were in production in New York, one of the last things that changed before we froze the show was the first scene. Uh, the first scene played so well in Denver uh, that I just, we didn't even, Mike Donahue and I just were like, great, first scene's working like gangbusters. We were gonna work on the rest of the play. And then we get we get in New York, and it's you know it's different actors, it's a different set, it's a different audience, it's a different everything, and uh, the play didn't kick in until scene two, and for the longest time we I you know we had other fish to fry, but eventually we looked back at the first scene and, and realized that the play that uh, the rest of the play had had changed so much that the the first scene needed to, uh, and I think that speaks to your, your what you were just talking about about there is something almost, uh, there can be something very um, methodical about a first scene there, it, it, at times that you, you do have to sort of like see what the rest of the play will become and then go back and make sure that that first scene supports it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Pinter, uh, we, I was almost tempted to start with the homecoming because Pinter said that the homecoming, he didn't know anything about the homecoming except for someone was looking for scissors. Like, mm -hmm. And that's the only thing he knew. I don't know if that's true, but I heard that. So we're gonna, I'm going to tell that story as if it's true, the caveat that it may not be true. But I believe that this is true, that, 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 that all he knew about that first scene was, um, I can't find the scissors, where have you put them? And, and, and the rest. But he had the benefit of being Harold Pinter. Because yeah. <laughs> I, th I think even though like, we're breaking all these scenes down and like finding all the great things in them, I feel like I'm with Robert that it's never, like when you're going through that first pass, it's never as conscious as like, okay, this line, is going to tell the audience everything about this play, and this next line is going to tell the audience everything about this play. Like I feel it's almost like you're subconsciously like picking at things as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, if you've written a good play, when you go back, you know there's all these beautiful things that you have kind of magically ended up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many productions would you say it usually takes before you lock in your script? Mm -hmm. Depends on the play. Right, like uh, Georgia McBride had two productions. Um, there'll be another production later this year somewhere uh, that uh, I plan to do a little bit of work at in before we, we, we publish it. Mm -hmm. uh, Whipping Man had, I think, four productions before I felt, felt that I was done. Um, and my play somewhere I'm still writing. I'm, I'm of the school uh, that plays are never finished, they're just abandoned. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. At a, at a certain point, you, you know, you've got where you've got to with it. And Do you find, is there, is there a place where you, you, you just, you know you're done? I mean, not done, but you're, you're going to yes. take, oh, yeah. put the yeah. crayons away. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I had a play here last year as well, One Night in Miami, and I thought I was done with it. <laughs> and I just changed the beginning. I cut like 15 pages a couple of weeks ago, then wrote another 20 pages, yeah. and I thought it was like locked. Yeah. But just, I'm starting to wonder. Like, I, I need to do what you need to do and just give up on it. Can you can you turn? <laughs> can you turn after you finish a play? Finish a play? Are you able to just turn your 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 writer's mind off when you watch it a, a, again? You must have seen. Rounds many times over the years, yes? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, do you watch that play and still edit it, or are you done? Uh, I can come back to a play such as Crowns, and I, I, I enjoy, uh, uh, over the years, it's had these various productions that uh, some I agree with, some I don't. Yeah. Uh, but always the spirit of the piece still holds, and so I'm always uh, uh, delighted by mm. that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I'm ever, I think a play is a living thing, uh, and so it continues. So if I have another opportunity to come back to it, as I'm coming back to a, a play called Ubladi, mm. uh, that was done um, uh, several years ago, I'm coming back to it now uh, 
in a different place in terms of being a writer, and certainly a different place in terms of the times that we're in. Uh, it's a piece about female jazz musicians in the 40s, and um, the times being uh, the men have gone off to war, women's baseball league, um, mm. Rosie the Riveter, and you have these all-female bands that sprang up during this time. The men are coming back home, this territory that the women have gained. Uh, uh, we don't know where we are right now. Uh, you have a black man coming back to the United States, and he's trying to figure out where he stands as well. Uh, I think it's, it, it's changed for me um, because of, I, I think, the journey that I've been on, uh, and certainly where we are right now informs me and, uh, to look at it in a different way. So I'm, I'm really challenged by uh, uh, rewriting the piece. Mm. Should we do another scene? So another way obviously plays begin um, the, from the days of Shakespeare uh, and beyond. Uh, sometimes they start with a speech. Uh, and. Uh, we are going to do one of those. Do a little switcheroo here. I'll just I'll say it. This is actually how the commissioning process works. <laughs> They put a series of chairs out and we walk around and they stop the music and then that's it. <clears throat> uh, we're going to do a Paul Vogel play. We're going to do the first scene, uh, we're going to do the first speech from Baltimore Waltz. Anna stage right in her trench coat, clutching the Berlitz pocket guide to Europe. Anna reads from a book. Help me please, uh, Dutch. Und u mich helpen abschlift? There's nothing I can do. French. I have no memory. Il n'y a rien à faire. Where are the toilets? Wo sind die Toiletten? I've never studied abroad. It's not that I don't want to, but the language terrifies me. I was traumatized by a junior high school French teacher. And after that, it was a lost cause. I think that's the reason I went into elementary education. Words like brioche, bidet, bildungsroman raise a sweat. <laughs> oh, I want to go. Carl, he's my brother. You'll meet him shortly. He desperately wants to go. But then he can speak six languages. He's the head librarian of literature and languages at the San Francisco Public Library. It's a very important position. The thought of 800-year-old houses perched on the sides of mountains and rivers, whose names you've only seen in the Sunday Times crossword puzzles, all of that is exciting. But I'm not going without him. He's read so much. I couldn't possibly go without him. You see, I've never been abroad, unless you count Baltimore, Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, one of the things that I love, she has the ability to do that most writers, it's just so cloying, is, 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 um, is talk directly to the audience, but in a way that sort of creates uh, a sense that the audience is a character in the play as well. Um, we are we aren't being, um, we aren't, things aren't being explained to us because the writer hasn't figured out how to actually write the scene so much as things are being explained to us because that's the only way the character can possibly uh, convey themselves, that they need our confidence. Um, I think that's, you know, that there was something about um, uh, just the, the, the very clear, precise, obvious way this play starts of like, so this is who I am and this is what's going on. And, and usually it doesn't go well when, it's, when you see that in plays because it's just like, you know, don't tell us, show us. But 
But Paula Vogel has this amazing way of just sort of like, kind of putting your arm around us and just going, here, this is what you need to know. It's almost as if she's whispering in our ear. Um, and, 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 and there is something, there's something about starting with a speech that can be very terrifying for, for an actor and it can be very terrifying for an audience. Um, but, um, you know, when those, those, those moments happen, um, they, they instantly create a bond with the audience. And I think she does that in this thing. And I think, too, she sets up the rules of the play with this monologue because yeah. it's a very theatrical play. There's a character in this play who plays many different roles. They go to Europe, he plays all different kinds of doctors and, you know, lovers and just a really hyper-theatricalized character. And so she sets this kind of other world up in this first monologue. Mm -hmm. um, and I also love how the humor that you mentioned, right? Because this play uh, is about Anna and her brother has HIV AIDS. And so uh, it's really a very poignant play, very moving play, a very tragic play. But yeah, there's so much humor. There's so much lightness. And she really reveals the, the reality to us slowly, but really brings us in with the humor that I think is really beautiful. Yeah. Um, can you start a play with speech? Have you done this? Anybody? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Let's just start a play with speech. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um. What are your experiences with it in terms of, do you, have you started, um, because we're doing another scene later that starts with speech. We're actually not doing the speech, but we're going into the scene. Um, in your experience, what has been the, the um, why do you do that? Why, why the choice of that in any particular play that you've done? It made sense for, for, that, for that particular uh, play. Uh, it was uh, Trinity River Plays. It was a trilogy uh, about this young girl uh, starting out as a young girl. Uh, starting uh, when she's uh, 17 years old, birthday, uh, to 17 years later, to um, uh, a little while later. Uh, so you see her at different points in her life. Uh, the first piece was Jarfly, and uh, it begins with her birthday. And I thought it was really important, uh, as it spoke to me, that we saw the essence of who she is mm -hmm. in this, uh, as it were, cocoon, uh, ready to come out. So we see her, uh, not literally, but uh, it is a cocoon, it's monologue, her speaking to mm. herself, revealing herself uh, in this first moment of the play. Mm -hmm. it, it, it spoke to me in that way. It's sort of much the same way the beginning of Glass Menagerie works, which is for Tom to say, um, I am of this world, but also I'm going to be a part, of, a, I'm apart from it. Uh, and you need to take me on both, in both terms. And he's not the narrator of the play, but the beginning of the play with that speech was the only time, except for perhaps at the end, uh, when, when he, um, no, not at the end, um, when he speaks to the audience, he, um, he, he sets himself apart and he says, watch me, um, which is important for that character in that play. You were going to say something, I know. Oh, I was also going to say, um, I don't know if I've ever started a play with a monologue, but I feel like when you do that, it's such a strong choice that it makes you pay attention to what does this mean? Like, in this case, like, this means this play is going to be about me or I'm going to take you to the story. And then it also made me think of uh, August Osage County, mm. where it starts with this like long, long monologue um, by the father, I think Bev Beverly, Beverly, Beverly um, who has this monologue we never see him again. And I, and I feel like that seems like so deliberate, mm. um, just to like the playwright is shining a spotlight on this character of like, pay attention to this. I almost picked that yeah. scene too. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a great first scene because it is also uh, unlike anything mm -hmm. else in the whole play. Uh, Beverly's mm -hmm. speech is so, um, just, he's so loquacious mm -hmm. and he's so philosophical and drunk. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and he does, that first scene in that play is so masterful because, um, you know, it, it's a 13 character play. Mm -hmm. And that gets expensive. And to write a character who is in only the first 10 minutes of the play and then vanishes uh, is 
is is ballsy in my idea. But like, but like think of what what the play would be if you didn't have that. If, would, if, the play if, would if, work if like it. the play started in scene two where they're like, Where's that? he's gone. Yeah. Like, would you care? No. I mean, maybe, but not as much as you do because you've seen him. Yeah. And um, and yeah, I think that's 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 another great example of of, of starting with a speech. Um, how are we doing on time? We should do the last scene. We should do the last scene. Yeah. Well, then let's do the last scene. Um, you're still here. Now you get to go. <laughs> now you get to make your cross. No, you get to make your big cross. You get to make your big cross. You take the middle. <laughs> so for our, so for our final number tonight, uh, we're going to be doing uh, the first scene from my all-time favorite play. Uh, if if I if there was only, if I had to only save one, I would save this one. Um, but I'll never have to make that decision in the digital age. Um, uh, we're going to do the first scene from Glass Menagerie. Um, we're not going to do the speech that starts the play, which definitely sets the tone and sets the character. I know it's such a beautiful it's a beautiful language. Uh, but I'm reading Tom, so we really don't want that. Um, um, I will say that I cribbed this totally from my play somewhere. I, the, the first scene just wasn't working like I wanted it to. And I was like, mm, we, need, we need to isolate this character. And I'm like, what would Williams do? And he would just like give a big speech on the fire escape. I was like, done, let's do that. Um, Williams did a much better job of it than I did. Uh, so Tom has set the scene. He's told us that this play is memory. Um, He's told us about all the um, the production elements that are going to go on in this scene, uh, in this play. Uh, he's going to tell us that we're we're watching a naturalistic play, but it's not going to be done naturalistically, uh, which is such a wonderful part of this play. Um, and and then the scene starts. Tom. Yes, mother. We can't say grace until you come to the table. Coming, mother. Honey. Yeah. He bows slightly and withdraws, reappearing a few moments later in his place at the table. Honey, don't push with your fingers. If you have to push with something, the thing to push with is a crust of bread. And chew, chew. Animals have secretions in their stomachs, which enable them to digest food without mastication. But human beings are supposed to chew their food before they swallow it down. Eat food leisurely, son, and really enjoy it. A well-cooked meal has lots of the delicate flavors that have to be held in the mouth for appreciation. So chew your food and give your salivary glands a chance to function. Tom deliberately lays his imaginary fork down and pushes his chair back from the table. I haven't enjoyed one bite of this dinner because of your constant directions on how to eat it. It's you that make me rush through meals with your hawk-like attention to every bite I take. Sickening, spoils my appetite. All this discussion of animals' secretions, salivary glands, mastication. Temperament like a metropolitan star. Tom rises and walks towards the living room. You're not excused from the table. I'm getting a cigarette. You smoke too much. I'll bring in the blanc -mange. Tom remains standing with his cigarette by the portieres. No, sister, no, sister. You be the lady this time and I'll be the darkie. I'm already up. Resume your seat, little sister. I want you to stay fresh and pretty for gentlemen callers. I'm not expecting any gentlemen callers. Sometimes they come when they're least expected. Why, I remember one Sunday afternoon in Blue Mountain. I know what's coming. Yes, but let her tell it. Again? She loves to tell it. One Sunday afternoon in Blue Mountain, your mother received 17 gentlemen callers. Why, sometimes there weren't enough chairs to accommodate them all. We had to send the nigger over to bring in the folding chairs from the parish house. How did you entertain those gentlemen callers? I understood the art of conversation. I bet you could talk. Girls in those days knew how to talk, I can tell you. Yes? Image on screen, Amanda as a girl on a porch greeting callers. They knew how to entertain their gentlemen callers. It wasn't enough for a girl to be possessed of a pretty face and a graceful figure, although I wasn't slighted in either respect. She also needed to have a nimble wit and a tongue to meet all occasions. What did you talk about? 
things of importance going on in the world, never anything coarse or common or vulgar. She addresses Tom as though he were seated in the vacant chair at the table, though he remains by the portieres. He plays this scene as though reading from a script. My callers were gentlemen, all. Among my callers were some of the most prominent young planners of the Mississippi Delta. Planners and sons of planters. Tom motions for music and a spot of light on Amanda. Her eyes lift, her face glows, her, vo her voice becomes rich. Screen legend, où sont les neiges d'antan? There was young Champ Laughlin, who later became vice president of the Delta Planters Bank. Hadley Stevenson, who drowned in Moon Lake and left his widow. 150,000 in government bonds. There were the Cure Couture brothers, Wesley and Bates. Bates was one of my particularly bright beau. He got into a quarrel with that wild Wainwright boy. They shot it out in front of the floor of Moon Lake Casino. Bates was shot through the stomach, died in the ambulance on his way to Memphis. His widow was also well provided for, came into eight or 10,000 acres, that's all. She married him on the rebound, never loved her, carried my picture on him the night he died. And there was that boy that every girl in the Delta had her kept set for. That beautiful, brilliant, young Fitzhugh boy from Greene County. What did he leave his widow? Never married. Gracious, you talk as though all of my old admirers had turned up their toes to the daisies. Isn't this the first you've mentioned that still survives? That Fitzhugh boy went north and made a fortune, came to be known as the Wolf of Wall Street. He had the Midas touch, whatever he touched turned to gold. And I could have been Mrs. Duncan J. Fitzhugh, mind you, but I picked your father. Mother, let me clear the table. No, dear, you go in front and study your typewriter chart or practice your shorthand a little. Stay fresh and pretty. It's almost time for our gentlemen callers to start arriving. How many do you suppose we're going to entertain this afternoon? Tom throws down the paper and jumps up with a groan. I don't believe we're going to receive any, Mother. What? No one? Not one? You must be joking. Laura nervously echoes her laugh. She slips into a fugitive manner through the half-open portieres and draws them gently behind her. A shaft of very clear light is thrown on her face against the faded tapestry of the curtains. Faintly, the music of the glass menagerie is heard as she continues. Not one gentleman <coughs> caller? It can't be true. There must be a flood. There must have been a tornado. It isn't a flood. It's not a tornado, Mother. I'm just not popular like you were in Blue Mountain. Tom utters another groan. Laura glances at him with a faint, apologetic smile. Her voice catches. Mother's afraid I'm going to be an old maid. The scene dims out with the glass menagerie music. So obviously I love the language in this scene. I mean, it's just like gorgeous, gorgeous language. And, and again, it's like almost like with the uh, Virginia Woolf opening, it's the entire play in a nutshell in this scene. It, it is all the characters, it's all the, the, the conflict. It's what uh, every, you know, the last line of the scene, Mother's Afraid I'm Going to Be an Old Maid, is, is in some ways what, you know, the motivation of the play can be reduced to. Um, uh, th there's, um, there's something I, you know, obviously there's something quite jarring in, in two of the lines in this, in this scene for a, a contemporary audience to hear. Um, and, and it's something that is so casually thrown out uh, by her. And it, it's so funny because it, it, it you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't paint her, it, it doesn't paint her as a bigot, it doesn't paint her as a, um, as an awful character is certainly not someone that we're made to sort of be aware of in that in those terms, but the casualness which which she throws it out, which isn't matched in any way by her two children. Um, it's like she's trapped in this other world and been like put down on and you yeah. know in this kind of tiny little cramped apartment. I would venture that it would have been inappropriate even you know even in its day uh, that the in. In this scene, as it's used, the, those words are not, um, they're just, I mean, you know, it's not, it's just, it's so, anach it, it almost is anachronistic within the, within the scene. Um, but everything we need to know about this woman is, is laid out I, I, right here in, in the thing. And, and that wonderful speech that, you know, she begins with of, like, instructing him how to enjoy his meal, um, you know, the, the setting the, the um, Setting the relationship up so 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 clearly and so purely, um, there there's there's I don't know I just I I, I, I just I, I love this I love this I love this play and I love this scene I love 
that the scene really, uh, the really does just, it's, it's impossible not to, whatever decide, what you decide to do with your production, it's impossible not to allow this scene to set the tone of the play. Um, you know, you talked about like setting a table. We literally do that in this scene. We literally set the table when we begin to eat dinner. Uh, and we're let into, into the world of this family. I think another element that I haven't talked about is stage directions, right? Yeah. And Williams has these incredibly ornate, poetic, lengthy stage directions um, that set up this world as well for the mm -hmm. reader, for the director, for the actors, the designers that we don't see on the stage, but it informs how the play gets produced. And I think, mm -hmm. I think it's just, I mean, he's like a master. And, but you know, in today's uh, theater, we don't see this. No. intricate, you know, list, uh, as he does. But I, I think it's another tool that these players are using, like also in Rajiv Joseph's piece, how he ex describes watching the Taj. Mm. And just on the page, it's like he describes how they see it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's an important part of these first scenes, how the playwright describes in the stage directions what this world looks like and feels like. I think it's, uh, it's good to take note of race in this play. Mm -hmm. I think he shrugs off race. So when... Um, He's placing those words in her mouth. Yeah. It is to place her in terms of not just time, because we use those words today. Sure. Uh, but it is to place it in terms of race and gender and place. Mm -hmm. uh, where is she in all of this? Uh, how she feels uprooted, uh, displaced, mm -hmm. could have been mm -hmm. uh, if she had married. Mm -hmm. And, and about being married rather than having a career, mm -hmm. or all of those things are spoken of uh, in terms of, of uh, the use of the N-word yeah. uh, and who she sees herself as, uh, as very serving or yeah. not serving. Well, and, and, and I love the juxtaposition, too, of the, this is not a very nice house. It's a very nice, nice apartment that they live in, you know? It's, mm -hmm. it's a rat trap. And, and that she's she's this Tuesday night dinner is this ele she wants it to be this elegant affair. So everything in this scene, uh, everything that Williams lays into the scene, it, it it really does establish her as as yeah from 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 a from wanting to hold on to the different to that old that old place, it's attempting to establish on a random Tuesday night at dinner that we're going to act as if. I mean, I think that's the, the, one of the big things of the play, is we will act as if. Yeah, we'll act as if we are rich and white rather than uh, displaced and like niggers. Yeah. Uh, is, is what we're saying, yeah. I, I think, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, a bold statement then as well as her. Any thoughts, sir? Oh, place. I was thinking about place. Um, and how each of these scenes, each of the opening scenes, has a very strong sense of place, even if it's not, even if it's a place that's not present, but desired or imagined. In this case, you have three people living in three very different places, actually. She's, Amanda's living in the past, or, or what should have been, and Laura is living in increasingly shrinking world of her own imagination. And Tom has already left. Tom can't wait to leave. Tom is looking beyond to go. Um, at Taj Mahal, you know, what a striking place to set a play uh, for the beginning. Um, and, um, and Virginia Woolf, it's, it's a home, but it's the middle of the night. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. And everything that that does to a house, it, nothing seems familiar.